Every year at the Mises Institute, we had the Schlarbaum Prize last night. Uh, we also give the uh, uh, Rothbard Prize. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful medal with Murray's likeness on it, uh, given to someone who has exemplified libertarian principles in the Rothbardian tradition. Uh, it also includes an ounce of gold, uh, and uh, this prize and, and the gold uh, is a result of a gift uh, from the late George W. Connell of Parachute, Colorado, who was a wonderful man, a very successful uh, oil geologist, and uh, himself a great libertarian. And so it's uh, many, great, many great people have gotten this award, and it's, it's my honor to present it to another one. Uh, Mr. Doug French not only has, an, a, has a devotion to Rothbardian principles, he had a devotion to Murray himself, and uh, received his, you'll see from his bio in, on the sheet, but he received his master's degree from Murray, and I can still remember Murray calling me so thrilled that he had a banker uh, who had the right views on economics. And, uh, Lou, Lou, my Doug French, though. So it, uh, it was great. So, Doug, come on up and let me present this medal to you and thank you in recognition of uh, all your great work and your devotion to Murray and to Rothbardianism, Mr. Doug French. Well, thank you, Lou. This is, uh, of course, a tremendous honor, and uh, I have a very, very soft spot in my heart for, for Murray. Uh, for those who don't know the story, I had no idea who Murray Rothbard was, and uh, was just sifting through the UNLV catalog uh, on about 1990 or thereabouts, and stumbled on a course called uh, EC 742, I believe, The History of Economic Thought and uh, taught by uh, Rothbard, it said. And uh, so I decided to enroll in the class, and actually uh, one of my classmates tried to talk me out of it. He said that uh, you don't want to take it with this Rothbard guy, he's a kook. <laughs> and he suggested another professor that I could take it independent study. And um, I, at the time, I was working full time, uh, as Lou mentioned, in the banking business, Yes, I was in the fractionalized banking uh, uh, business, so I'm a, I'm a banker with a checkered past, for sure. But, uh, so I was urged not to take Murray, but, you know, I was working during the day, and I didn't, I didn't really want to play the politics of, of uh, those uh, working on their masters, so I just went ahead and showed up the first day, and I remember Murray coming in, and uh, a gentleman by the name of James Philbin carrying a stool behind him. And uh, Murray had a pocket full of pins, and the minute he hit the door, he started talking. And it was about the first Gulf War, and the craziness of those politicians trying to, trying to uh, lower gas prices. Don't they understand supply and demand? And he just, he just went on from there. There was no talking about syllabuses. There was no talking about uh, taking role. Uh, he had centuries and centuries and centuries of economic history to cover, and he got right to it. So believe me, I, uh, I uh, thank uh, my lucky stars every day uh, Butler mentioned serendipity last night, and believe me, I was hit very hard by the serendipity stick, and I am, uh, I am very pleased. And when you get struck by Murray's kind of lightning, you feel like you need to give back, and uh, what I, uh, I don't give back to United Way, I don't give back to uh, local charities, uh, but I've tried to give back to the, to the Mises Institute. And you know, when we talk about Murray, uh, and his name has come up over and over in this conference, um, and, and, we, uh, and Lou mentioned last night about how many, uh, how many Mises Institutes there are, uh, there's not very many Rothbard Institutes. And, um, and it's not because necessarily that he was so radical that nobody wants to name their institute uh, for him. It is really the, uh, the market power, if you will, the brand name that has been created by Lou Rockwell's 30 years and your 30 years of support. 
I was just in Bodrum, Turkey at an event. I met with some young guys who most of them are running Mises Institutes around the world. And there was a, a discussion I participated in. And the question was asked, why did you name your institute Mises Sweden or Brazil or Lithuania or whatever it was? And the question uh, and the answer always was, there is a brand name that's been created with Mises. When Mises is the name of your organization, you know it's legitimate, you know that uh, it's uncompromising in its ideas, and you know that it's part of something much, much bigger. So all of you should be uh, commended for creating not only something that resides at 518 West Magnolia in Auburn, Alabama, not only at Mises Org in the United States, but Lou mentioned these organic, uh, this organic creation of Mises Institutes all over the world. And it's a credit to him, and it's a credit to you for creating a brand that is, uh, again, uncompromising in its uh, devotion to liberty. I, uh, I hope that Murray is uh, looking down upon us today, and I think the first thing he would say probably is, how could you get my medal so early in the morning? Uh, for those of you who knew Murray, he was very much a night owl, and uh, so to ask him to speak before noon was definitely something you didn't, uh, you didn't want to do. But, uh, uh, but I think that, uh, I would hope anyway, that Murray is at least in some small way uh, a proud, of, uh, proud of me. And uh, what I do know for sure is that he is very proud of his friend, Bert Blumert, who passed away, unfortunately, a couple years ago. And he is very, very, very proud of Lou Rockwell for the great work that he's done to build this organization over 30 years. And beyond being proud, he is overjoyed at what you as donors have created in the Mises Institute. So you can be very proud of that. I'm sure Murray is smiling down upon us. You know, uh, Lou told me a long time ago uh, a very pithy little saying. He said, no tank, no think. And so, Believe me, most of you are the tank, and there are a few thinkers here, but it takes the tank to make the thinking work. So I thank all of you uh, for your uh, support of the Mises Institute. I thank you, uh, Lou, um, and the board for this recognition, uh, the Murray Medal. Um, it means uh, so much to me, and uh, believe me, uh, your reach is beyond what happens in Auburn has not stayed in Auburn. It has gone worldwide. So thank you. Thank you. And now I have work to do. During the debates and on the campaign trail, probably one of your favorite candidates, Mitt Romney, said repeatedly that the first thing he would do on day one of the many things he could do, because it's not like America has any problems, but the first thing he would do is cite China for manipulating its currency. It's the first thing he would do. Take the oath, his hand would come down, he would kiss Anne, and immediately, uh, immediately call China a currency manipulator. I was thinking this is truly the pot calling the kettle black. Uh, in fact, it was just a couple of weeks ago that the Brazilian finance minister blasted the Fed's uh, QE3, or if you will, QE infinity policy for setting off cur currency wars around the world. Uh, again, this year we've had the Fed, we've had the ECB, we've had the Bank of Japan all announcing uh, easing within days of one another. 
And the effects are inflation in China, food riots in Egypt, stock bubbles around the world, consumer price inflation in Brazil, and higher unemployment in developing countries. Now, Romney's hectoring of, of China is, is really not so harmless. Uh, you combine this Romney rhetoric uh, with the Federal Reserve's QE to uh, forever uh, policy, and uh, these are the sounds of what would we will call, uh, at least for the purposes of this talk, Currency War Three. And it is in its initial stages. Now, I think most people in this room accept that the big picture is that governments uh, eventually uh, inevitably reduce the value of their currencies to their intrinsic value, and that would be the value of the paper, or virtually zero. But in the meantime, politicians are looking for votes, and governments look for an advantage over competing governments. It's not just rockets and bombs that gets fired. It's uh, a war is raged on an economic front, and currency manipulation is the primary weapon. And just as America's military industrial complex wages war all over the world, forget about this strong dollar, dollar policy that you continually hear and have heard for years. America has been the leading advocate of currency devaluation or debasement for the last 200 years. Through the revolution, through the Civil War, the Great Depression, uh, the inflation of the Carter years, and now uh, Bernanke's QE forever, we are continually devaluing the dollar. Uh, James Rickards uh, has written a wonderful book called Currency Wars, and he warns of a complete collapse in the dollar during this uh, Currency War III. He says the Fed chair, Ben Bernanke, is engaged in the greatest gamble in the history of finance. He says the dollar crash is overdue, and it's not a matter of guesswork. The preconditions are already in place. Bernanke's attempt to print America's, uh, America's way out of its economic jam is, in essence, a declaration of currency wars against the entire planet. He writes that the new currency war is the most meaningful struggle in the world today the only struggle that determines the outcome of all others. And he explains that while currency wars are fought on the world stage, they actually begin at home. They, it, they begin with domestic policy. This, when you have a, an economy lacking in growth, an economy with high unemployment, a weak, weak banking sector, worsening public finance, with economic growth stymied time and time again, Countries look to depreciate their currencies and promote export growth and investment. Now, there was once a classic gold standard uh, that really was practiced around the world. It was long ago that most of us don't remember, only from the history books. But it was self-equilibrating. Uh, it operated essentially like a club. Uh, the members strictly adhered to... Uh, the rules that were unwritten, but they will, were well understood. Uh, free market forces prevailed. Government interventions were minimal. Exchange rates were stable. What kept this all in place? How did this happen? Well, the Federal Reserve hadn't been created yet. There was no U.S. central bank to mess up monetary matters. This monetary tranquility was jarred with the creation of the Federal Reserve in 1913. And as Murray Rothbard explained in a book, uh, I hope is out front for sale. If not, it's certainly on the uh, Institute's website in the bookstore, The History of Money and Banking in the United States, the Colonial Era to, uh, to World War II. The Federal Reserve Act was just part of a wave of legislation brought about by the progressive movement. At the time, big business was tired of competing and continually innovative to stay ahead of falling prices, because that's what you have when you have a stable monetary unit. As uh, innovations are made, prices fall, there's a continuing array of competitors, and uh, big business was, uh, was uh, tired of that. 
and they wish to use the power of government to establish and maintain cartels in an effort to ensure high profits. The plan was to, quote, transform the economy from a roughly laissez-faire to centralized and coordina uh, coordinated statism, according to Rothbard. Now, what uh, Rickards calls Currency War I began with the German hyperinflation in 1921, and it ended with France breaking with gold in 1936 at the same time that England was devaluing the pound sterling. In between, there were various uh, continuous um, monetary uh, fireworks. For those of you who've seen uh, a great uh, movie by Woody Allen, uh, Midnight in Paris, you were probably struck uh, by the number of uh, uh, very creative um, and uh, literary, uh, literary types, uh, U.S. expatriates that ended up in Paris uh, in the mid-1920s. Well, you wouldn't be surprised that there's actually an economic answer for why they were there at the same time. And that's because the French franc had uh, collapsed in 1923. And so the Ernest Hemingway, Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald, Gertrude Stein, they could all afford comfortable lifestyles living in Paris because the franc had collapsed and they could use their strong dollars at the time uh, to live a very comfortable lifestyle um, in Paris. Now, by this time, the classic gold standard was long gone. It's replaced by a deeply flawed gold exchange standard that allowed central banks to inflate and caused the boom in the 1920s, and therefore it required the, the uh, correction of the 1930s, which, of course, we've heard about previously that uh, FDR essentially exacerbated with his government policies. FDR st started his term in office actually by, by closing banks. It was one of the first things that he did. And then he confiscated the people's gold. In fact, the, the language of FDR's, um, FDR's order is really quite chilling. It's, it said that uh, citizens have until May 1st, 1933, to deliver to the Federal Reserve System, quote, all gold gold bullion and gold certificates now owned by them. And this was under the threat of a $10,000 fine or 10 years in prison. $10,000 at the time in 1933 was a fair amount of money. 10 years of prison is always a fair amount of time in prison. <laughs> now citizens received, uh, they didn't go away empty handed when they brought in their gold. They got 20, uh, they got uh, $20.67 per ounce, only to watch the new president move the price up to $35 an ounce after he had confiscated it all, and that amounts to a 70% uh, devaluation. Now, Rickards places uh, Currency War II from 1967 to 1987. In between uh, Currency War I and Currency War II, we had the Bretton Woods Agreement. Uh, which was a phony gold standard that uh, Henry Hazlitt, who, uh, as Lou mentioned la last evening, was uh, one of the initial supporters in the Mises Institute, Henry Hazlitt actually predicted that it would collapse, and this set the stage for Currency War II. Now, Currency War II began with a number of crises uh, in the British uh, sterling and then a flight from the dollar into gold. Uh, and Charles de Gaulle called for a, uh, a return to the gold standard. And in fact, uh, the, president, the French president uh, said he would be very helpful. Uh, he, ha uh, he offered to send the French Navy to the United States to ferry the gold back uh, to France. Uh, I, I don't think Americans have viewed the French quite the same way ever since. Uh, this all led up to Richard Nixon, of course, preempted everybody's favorite show, Bonanza, on uh, August 15th. I don't know how he had the audacity to do that. August 15th, 1971, uh, telling the nation that he was closing the gold window because of the evil international speculators. He left out the part about the money printing and budget deficits and all that. Uh, it was the evil international speculators. He instituted a 10% surtax, uh, by the way, on all imports, so he effectively devalued the dollar in the trade arena. Now, the de devaluation was to spur uh, employment, but within two years, the United States was mired again in a recession, 
It suffered three recessions between 73 and 81. And while uh, at the same time, purchasing power dropped from 77 to 81, uh, dropped in half. Suddenly, everyone was talking about something that uh, they'd never heard of before, stagflation, something that wasn't supposed to happen according to the Keynesians. Of course, tall Paul Volcker, who doesn't seem to be able to go away, uh, at the time, he took over his Fed and uh, hiked interest rates. Uh, price of gold plummeted and the dollar strengthened. But that dollar strength finally gave, uh, got in the way of export, uh, export jobs. And the, and the Plaza Accord of September 85 was an attempt to drive down again the greenback's value primarily against the yen and the mark. And it worked. From 85 to 88, the dollar fell 40% against the French franc. It was cut in half against the yen, and it was dropped 20% against the mark. However, that devaluation did little for the U.S. economy. And in 87, uh, they met again at the, uh, the Louvre in, in Paris. And in the Louvre Accord, it was hatched, again, to stop the dollar's fall. The Bank of the, J the Japan participated. And they were very willing to expand their money supply to depreciate the yen uh, versus the dollar. Well, this depreciation of the yen versus the dollar kicked off one of the greatest stock market booms in the history, uh, probably in the history of the world. The Nikkei index went from 10,000 in, in 1985, and by the end of the decade, it was almost 39,000. And if you follow the Nikkei index, you'll know that uh, two decades later, that market has never, ever recovered. So currency, three, currency War 3 has just begun. And this one's going to be the worst one yet. After 40 years of massive government uh, money printing and explosion of derivatives, and uh, see, uh, Currency War 3 will be fought on a massive scale. And it's a real risk to the entire monetary system. So how this is going to end up, we really don't know. But, you know, Mises had a three-step program, uh, or, or he thought there was three steps to inflation. First, government could print all they want, and prices wouldn't go up nearly as much as the money supply. That's kind of where we are now. In stage two, the demand for money falls. That intensifies price inflation. And in st stage three, prices go up faster than the money supply. Then the shortage of money... Uh, causes the public to agitate government to print more, and when government does more of this, then prices and money supply spiral upward, and that's when we have hyperinflation. So a small change in preferences among just a few people could lead to this collapse because financial framework is just this weakly constructed Keynesian con traption of fiat money, government deficits, and financial alchemy. Any one of a thousand events could trigger the collapse, and the last straw we won't know until after the fact. It's been said that war is the health of the state. I've heard that at this conference. It's certainly true. But I'd say currency wars are a sign of a desperate government that's willing to do anything it can to wreck its citizens' lives to benefit its own agenda. Chaos is the most likely outcome of the latest currency war. It's not going to be pretty. After the desperation, government gets mean. And when government gets mean, after their currencies collapse, they freeze the people's assets, they grab the people's gold, and they institute capital controls. Unfortunately, currency war is neither a spectator sport, and it's certainly not a game. We all have to participate because this is the government's war that's on each and every one of us. It's not a matter of if, the war has already started. Now's the time to get prepared. Thank you.